Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Beatles News Brief. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and with me is the author of Beatleness and our contributing editor, Candy Leonard. Hello, Candy. Hey, Steve. How you doing? I'm doing fine. This is kind of a special show because Wednesday the 30th is the 50th anniversary of the Beatles Rooftop Concert. And what we have in store, in addition to the news, which we're going to hold off till the end, um, is a couple of interview clips. One I did in 2011 with Michael Lindsay Hogg, the director of Let It Be, and another with Ken Mansfield, author of The Roof, who was on The Roof that day. But before we get into those clips, uh, Candy and I uh, wanted to discuss the event, and I wanted to get her thoughts on what she thinks about this whole thing and and you know, put a little bit of historical and whatever significance on, on this. Um, Candy, what do you think about this? What do you think about the rooftop concert in general? I'm in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, there we go. That's a, that's a good start. Um, well, I, it's hard to believe it's been 50 years. Um, I have a few thoughts about it. I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, we've all seen so many – sort of clips of it and YouTube and, you know, different, um, we've seen it out of context, but it's interesting to remember that the first time we saw this was at the finale in Let It Be, in the movie, back in <laughs> May, back in May of 1970. So, I mean, I actually almost forgot that, like, that's where I first saw it. Like, I had to think back about it because it's been like so many of their things, you know, recontextualize and we see it in all different places. But yeah, so, you know, when we first saw it, we, it was the Beatles had, it was spring of 1970. The Beatles had just broken up. The McCartney album had just come out. So it was a really kind of, um, you know, poignant time for Beatle fans. And I think that, um, you know, let it, the film was kind you know, in the knowing that they had broken up, I think that we saw a lot of the, you know, we, it was kind of a Rorschach test in a way, but like by today's standards, I suppose. But we saw, you know, the, the discord and we saw that maybe they didn't look so happy. And, and of course, Yoko and people didn't quite know what to make of that. But that the scene that we're focusing on today, the rooftop, was really a kind of really grand finale in the, you know, capital G, capital F. Um, you know, it was the last time they played in public. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking back to this notion, you know, John's, um, you know, his, his uh, inspirational phrase about, you know, top, uh, topper most of the popper most. I mean, there they were on the roof. You can't get more topper than that. And there's something I think really sort of the metaphor of them being ascendant in that way as their final performance. There's something very, um, dare I say, almost spiritual about it. Mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, some of the context around that is what the clip of, uh, with Michael Lindsay Hogg, um, which will be the uh, first clip um, he addresses. But it, it, at the same time, you know, uh, uh, what's really kind of interesting is that they were getting back to the people. Yeah. You know, because they were cause, because they were playing on a roof. This was not a formal concert. This was not Candlestick Park. This was not, you know, Dodger Stadium uh, or, you know, many of the other places they played. This was a, a roof where anybody that was in the vicinity, vicinity could have, you know, come around and heard Right. And, and and a lot of people a lot of people did from which we could saw which we saw in the Let It Be movie. Right, they created a happening. Right, what they it, did it, in it did. you know in sixties parlance. So what we might one of the people I one of the fans I interviewed for Beatleness referred to it as saw it as kind of like a flash mob. You know ah, that that yeah, that's a great know, description. Like, yeah, you, you hear the music, you don't, I mean, imagine, you know, City Street and, you know, you work in that area and you hear this, of course, you know, everybody knew who it was because they knew that they were, you know, had offices there and people just, you know, I mean, if you look at, you know, how people were looking up and it's really, I love, I was, you know, looking at it yesterday and the, 
the clothing that the secretaries, you know, the women who are like on their mm -hmm. lunch break and the men in their suits. And it was just really, it was, it was really like for the people. I mean, and I mean, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think what I understand is how it came about was because they wanted to play live and the logistics of playing live had gotten so difficult. They couldn't identify an appropriate, you know, a venue that would work. So they thought, well, why not just do it there? And, I, you know, I, I, I wonder if they thought about like what would happen or would people try to come up or, or whatever. It was real. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's really, you know, the, the way that they disrupted that sort of, you know, very stuffy sort of neighborhood there is kind of a metaphor really for the disruption that they caused in general in straight society you know? right and then right. the appointment you know that they're up there on the roof i mean you you know like up at the top and i don't know it's a very interesting a uh, piece of piece of footage you know the, the um yeah, I mean, they, they brought people together, you know, all these sort of straight business people and secretaries and old men in bowler hats and the bodies in their hats. And um, it was really very interesting. And, and the I guess one of the, uh, you know, the idea that the police came to break it up, but um, they really kind of, I guess what you can see and also what, you know, we've since heard is that the police you know they kind of got into it too in their own way mm -hmm. um you know that that they were sort of i mean you know to, to stumble upon that at lunchtime i mean and, and to then and for the cops to then have to sort of go and address it i mean it must have been quite a thrill for the people who were there um but i wanted to talk about the the chemistry between the four of them too which i thought was very interesting um Again, all this talk about division and, you know, rifts and Yoko being disruptive and all this. But if you look at the chemistry and the eye contact between John and Paul, it really is quite beautiful. You know, they, they're having fun doing what they love to do, which is to play music together. Right. And, 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 it, it, and, it, and yeah, and, if, uh, you know, of all the places to do it, they're, I mean, here's the biggest band in the world playing on a, playing on a freaking roof. I mean, you know, uh, even the Rolling Stones, well, I should say the Rolling Stones did one thing that I can recall comes close to that is when they did the little surprise thing on the back of the pickup truck that that went through, I think it went through Times Square. Um, but I mean, this was this was a whole concert. I mean, that was just a kind of a very quickie little thing that the Stones did. This was, this was a whole, you know, several songs that the right. Beatles did and it was planned, but yeah, it, you know, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing event. And the other thing too, is that what people need to remember is let it be was originally planned as a TV show. So this is, this was supposed to be the, the, climax of a tv right. show and they and the fact they, they you know they left it in the movie seems a, a bit odd but it, it's, it's the thing that everybody points to about that movie well, it, now. It, it served really the same purpose in the in the film in other words it is the climax and and you know and it, again when we saw it, it you know it, we saw this in may of 1970 so really over like 15 months after it was filmed. And so, so much had happened since. You know, Abbey Road hadn't happened yet. Uh, neither Paul and John hadn't gotten married yet. And it, it was, it was, you know, the time, the disruption of the timeline, even to this day, kind of makes it confusing at, at times. But um, it, it really serves as a real monument, I think, to, um, you know, to their greatness. I, I, a couple of things I noticed about it, too. I, but, mm -hmm. I, I, Paul looks better now than he did in that clip. I think. I thought George actually looked pretty good of all you know, of the four good. of them, but I think if anybody looked good, it was George. Yeah, uh, George definitely looked good. Well, I think that was George's best period, actually. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, Paul looked overweight. He looked. Uh, I'd say he looked. I mean, he, they were all having fun, but the the way he was dressed kind of made him stand apart, and also that that big full beard that he had um i he, i don't think he looked so great the other interesting thing you know people talk about the rivalries between john and paul all these years one of the things i've noticed and i don't know what its significance is 
Uh, maybe somebody would want to opine on this, but they, they know, you know, they both had um, beards on and off. Mm -hmm. And the beards are very much a symbol of masculinity. You know, they never both had a big, you know, full beard at the same time. And I think that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure why, but um, I you're, talking, you're talking about during the Beatles, the Beatles. Not, yeah. late, not later. Yeah, they, you know, they, they both had beards at different times, but never at the same time. But there's something about Paul's beard there and his weight and his choice of the suit. I don't know. It, it's like he was in some sense, a part, but yet in terms of the music and the chemistry, he, they were all quite, you know, cohesive, but I don't know, I just thought his, his appearance was, there was something about it that seemed, um, I don't know, can't quite put my finger on it. Okay. But right, um, right. yeah, I mean, it was just, it was wacky, you know, it was the Beatles, you know? Okay. All right. Let's bring on the first clip of, and this is a, uh, an old clip, uh, I talked to Michael Lindsay Hogg, the director of Let It Be in 2011 on the release of his book. And we talked about a lot of things, not just the rooftop, but here's Michael Lindsay Hogg talking about not only the rooftop concert, but Let It Be the film itself. Um, talking about the, the, the movie on, um, on DVD, um, uh, I interviewed Ron Fermanek, who restored the movie, and he said he made a great point that um, the film has a much more positive look in the restored version than the the grainy print that's been surf that's been around for years and years. Um, is that closer to the original intention of the film to be a a more positive film, or or did you know uh, was it, were you were you trying to make it what it was, or what it what it's always appeared to be? Well, I'll tell you what I think is that um, when the film first came out in 1970, mm -hmm. that's actually when the Beatles broke up. And the, the fans, the audience, were heartbroken and angry that the Beatles had broken up. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they thought the film was in some ways a kind of downer because that's the period it was documenting the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But it was never intended to be an upper or a downer. It was just intended to be what it is. However, uh, the rooftop concert, which um, we decided to do because the, 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 it originally was going to be a television special, then we couldn't agree on what the television special was going to be. Then it turned into a documentary because we were shooting footage which is going to be used as a teaser if mm -hmm. there ever was a television special. And so then we decided to go up in the roof and do a concert. That's a very, very up experience because they didn't know it and we didn't know it. It's the last time they ever played together to any kind of audience. They were happy while they played. All the kind of sniping and, and you know, um, them getting on, on each other's nerves, that was all gone. They were really happy they rocked and they rolled like they had when they were teenagers so the movie has a has a very up ending now and then but what's happened between when it was first released and now which is i don't know 40 years later 40 years mm -hmm. later, is um well two of them have died um i mean john was murdered and george died mm -hmm. and so we 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 look at the in an entirely different way we we look at it with our own knowledge of the poignancy of what happened to them um that they did break up that they were these extraordinary guys and musicians who changed the world but that 40 years later we have an entirely different understanding of what was going on at the time than the audience feel it with more what I'd like to see. The rooftop concert has always been fantastic, but I think we look at it as with much more, what would I say, much more tenderness now at these young men trying to figure out what was the next step for them. Like, you know, Paul wanted to do something, play live. George just wanted to stay in the studio. And so I think there's much more true appreciation of them now and what their struggles were when you see the movie now than what it was like, you know, 40 years ago. Does the, um, does the picture 
uh, still have the graininess that the um, original release had? Or uh, the it... last time I saw it, no. It's we saw, you know, I don't know also what version people have seen lately because, you know, it hasn't been commercially available or available in anything except bootlegs, basically, for the right. first X number of years. And so if it's great, it was never that grady, actually, because we shot it on 16 millimeter and then we blew it up to 35 and, and you know, washed the print very carefully. So it wasn't really that grainy. Um, but now, thanks to n- new technology and color correction and things, uh, the movie looks wonderful. When you went over the rooftop concert, I didn't really have a follow up, but I, but I, 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 everybody always wants to know about the rooftop concert, and you kind of gave a little description about that. I mean, I've talked to Ken Mansfield, who was there, and he, you know, he told me some stuff about that too. Um, I mean, when you, when the police came in, did it, you know, was that? Um, I I believe you said that you had you had the um, the cameras on the on the mirror so that you would catch the police coming in because you knew they were. No, there. what I we we thought. Listen, we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know if if we would play and it would be wonderful. We didn't know what the weather was going to be like. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a sense though because of the 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 building the businesses which are around in that area because you know the Beatles were. Um, very unusual occupants of a building in that part of London because it's usually a lot of high-end tailors, um, fancy businesses, respectable businesses, mm-hmm. and suddenly you had all these crazy long-haired hippies walking in and out of their building in Savile Row. Mm-hmm. So we weren't sure what would happen, but there was a chance that there would be complaints. Not that we wanted them, but no one cared if that's happened, because we thought this is all part of what we're going to learn when we do the rooftop, is the day before we were going to shoot, I had const- I had constructed in the corner of the uh, of the lobby, the foyer in Apple, a two-way mirror. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't shooting into mirrors. It was actually a two-way mirror. So I had put a camera behind it so that in case the police did come in, as they did, they would think, oh, there's just a mirror there in the corner of the of the room, camera behind it, so we could get them uh, pacing around because this would lead us up onto the roof. So it was, yes, sure, I was thinking ahead, might this happen, and then it did happen. And so they put very interesting shots, the police, you know. Right. Everyone's trying, to, everyone's trying to delay them. Oh, yes, Mr. Policeman, thank you. Wait here for a second. Let me just go and get so-and-so. You know, then five minutes more elapse, we do five minutes more of music on the roof. And then Mal Evans comes down, and they talk to him. Oh, yes, all right, Mr. Policeman, let me think about that for a second. And so he got another five minutes on the roof. And then Mal takes him up, and then he, he, the policeman says, you have to stop. You can do one more song, otherwise we're going to have to arrest you. Now, that was going to be a very big problem, because how are they going to arrest the Beatles? If it was right. one or two cops up there, they'd have had to get you know six cops. They'd have had to unplug the amps, and it would have been a sensational scandal, Beatles right. arrested, you know? So they didn't really want to do it. And also in those days, the, the cops on the roof, I mean, that young cop, I mean, he's thrilled to be there. He's up in the roof with the Beatles playing, you know? And what could be, you know, he's going to go home to his, to his wife and his kids and say, you never can guess where I was today. Right. And so in, in one way, they were going to arrest us if we didn't stop. But in another way, it was a great experience. And in those days, the English police were not rough. They, they, they never carried firearms. They didn't have to. Um, because even, I think, when um, uh, the death penalty was blocked in England, I think the only reason for it would be of killing a policeman in the, in the course of his duty. So there were, the police were unarmed. Not that they weren't tough, the cops and stuff like that, but it was a, it was a kind of different time. And so the police were, um, anyway, we thought the police might be involved, and that's why, why I put up the mirror. Well, that was Michael Lindsay Hogg, the director of Let It Be. There were some interesting things in there that really caught me. The way they had planned Let It Be, the way he said the movie was a lot more, the way it, I mean, if you see the movie the way it should be seen without all the grainy prints, it has a different face on it than it does with the grainy prints. And and the way they set up the police uh, shot, 
and you know knowing that the that the um, police were kind of actually being used in the film which i thought was kind of which i thought was kind of funny um what do you think candy i it was interesting to to hear his perspective he said something that really struck a chord with me um and i think i've said this before in some of our conversations recently about how you know looking at them now you know at, at the age i am now and looking at them like they look like you know four you know young men finding their way in the world you know and and i, I think he used the word tenderness mm-hmm. and i i totally i mean i that's how i feel sometimes like i look at them with this feeling of you know one a sense of wonder of course and you know just appreciating the music and all that but there's this you know them as as people and the crazy life they lived and here they were and it was almost all over although at that moment it you know it was as i said it was 15 months before the breakup but there's something you know you look at them and again like i think he said something about um looking at them with tenderness and i totally get that you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i thought that was very sweet and he said something about understanding their struggles i think something like that right and i and again like i totally get that i mean they had the world at their feet in that scene literally you know because they were at the toppermost of their building there. But um, yeah, there was something, um, it's, it's very poignant to look at it now, you know? Mm-hmm. I know, and uh, it, it, hopefully, and, it, and it's looking like, I mean, we're getting a little hints that it will be released again. Um, I mean, I, that story aside that Paul is thinking about a, a new, cut of, of let it be i sure as hell hope that they're not planning on not releasing the movie as it was yeah i think I that mean, was a really big mistake to basically re-edit it to tell a different story i but you know i i mean i think that for historical reasons they should just leave it as it was that said and I know I'm going to be criticized for being anti-Paul, but you could imagine Paul wanting to kind of re-edit the whole thing to tell a different story. But I think well, that would be a mistake. I here's my here's my feeling on this. They can they can re-edit the movie and make a director's cut if they want to, as far as I'm concerned, as long as they put the original print out again. I think I think for historical reasons you have to do that. You can't so you think there should be the original and then the director's cut being the for lack of a better phrase sanitized version. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't and I think sanitized is the wrong word, although that's probably what you're going to be looking at, you know. I mean, look at what they did with Let It Be Naked, which I mean, is fine to a point. And as I was telling as I and I think uh, it's on the the uh, my the topic uh, the uh, discussion with Ken Mansfield. Um, I to this day think instead of let it be naked, they should have put out the original Get Back album. I think that was a big mistake not to do that. Number one, I think it sounds just as good, um, and they could have te- technically, you know, um, fixed the tape, you know. Uh, remastered the tape um, like they did with Let It Be Naked. The The thing about Let It Be Naked is it sounds great. They did great work with the sound on that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they could have, I think they could have done it with Get Back. And well, they eventually do that, you know. I mean, th- there's so many things that they could still, you know, so many products that they could put out still um. right and and that gets around to the fact that they are they are getting more and more comfortable with their marketing and they are more like i mean look at the if you go through the beatles um store the official store the wide array of beetle products is getting 
bitter and wider and crazier every year. And having, and in a way, having you know, moving further away from the music and really marketing them as a brand, you know, as a. And I think the visual is a big piece of it. And again, that gets back to the, you know, the various artwork, with, you know, the pictures of them as these icon, you know, as icon. But yeah, but I mean, but, I mean look at, look at the way they've embraced the cartoon images, but exactly. not the cart not the cartoons themselves. Right. That's that's really that's really telling right there. If you ask well, what me, what comes to mind is the uh, you know like the Warhol images of Elvis or or Marilyn. You know, like just the, the pure visual fact of you know reality of them in those you know frozen in time. Um, you know, still young men. I mean, you know, and so I think that. Yes, there are all those products in the store, but, and you know, what is like socks, clothing, house, you know, home decor. I mean, like you name it. And I think that's going to continue, you know? Yeah, no, I do too. Let's get into Ken Mansfield. This is Ken Mansfield, who was liaison between the U.S. and the U.K. for Apple Records. This was recorded uh, late last year um, because of the release of his book, The Roof which uh, is available on Amazon in print form and in uh, digital. So, uh, and there will be links, by the way, for that uh, in our, uh, that's what I want, Beatles store on Facebook. Anyway, uh, here goes Ken Mansfield. Let's uh, let's talk yeah. about talk about the rooftop concert and how crazy that day okay. was. I had, uh, a couple of years ago, I talked to Michael Lindsay Hogg and he told me about, you know, the whole thing with the police and everything. I mean, what was it? What do you remember about that? Uh, I think they, uh, to me, in retrospect, uh, they made a much bigger deal out of that. Uh, and everybody that reports that, because to me, because when I'm on the roof, I'm not seeing what's coming in downstairs or what's happening down mm-hmm. there other than the pictures I've seen of Mal going down and dealing with him. But it sounded to me, or felt like to me, that the police came they came partly out of duty and partly because of the complaints of the, the, the stodgy people next door and you know, down the street and stuff. And they were excited when they found out it was, and they got to be a part of this. So they totally cooperated with Mal. And I think I said in the book, too, sometimes I forget, but I think if Neil would have been down there, it might have been a whole different story because Neil was a little bit more caustic and a little more harder edge. But Mal just made friends with him. And so they worked with him. They came up. I mean, uh, there was a time that they allowed it to go so that, you know, things needed to be accomplished up there. And they were in sync with, okay, now we can shut it. Now now we'll shut it down, right? But we'll wait until this is done or, or whatever. Uh, it was never that dramatic to me. I made it even more dramatic in a way just by input of other people when I wrote about in the book because, there were other observations on that. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, I, I wasn't watching that as much other than just seeing uh, Mal's guy, the guy come up, Mal brought him up, and he's standing there with Mal, and, and it's like they're talking, you know, like, oh, okay, now, or <laughs> you know, whatever. So it didn't seem that dramatic to me. Did Michael, was it dramatic? Did he think it was dramatic? Or? Well, I mean, he, he talked about, you know, uh, I guess photographing it from his, you know, from his standpoint, photographing it. Yeah. It came across, it certainly comes across as somewhat dramatic in the movie, as you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but were you... Well, look at it. When you, when, when you look at pictures or even in the film, do you see a lot of, a lot going on with the police or not a not not, a, not a ton i mean you, but they do it's it's interesting that they show up you know and and uh, yeah but they're down they are well i actually i take that back they are down in the street directing traffic so or yeah. you know so yeah there is there is a little bit of, of interaction there with them you know i think the drama was down there and getting into the building and by the time it got up, not, not, I'm guessing now, but by the time it got up to the roof, then I think it got a little bit more organized between Mal and, and the police and and you know, what was going down. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, cause I, I can't speak for the street other than what I've heard. I just know it was a madhouse down there from one of the guys that came in during the thing. He said it was just amazing down there. He said he came around the corner on his way to the office at Apple, and he said it was like a wall of sound. He said, "Man, it just hits you in the face." You know, they were playing. They were playing that loud. 
Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a, that's a word he used. It was like a wall of sound. I turned the corner and bam. You know? mm. <laughs> did everybody, I mean, it, it, this may sound like a dumb question, but did everybody know who it was? Was everybody, you know, did everybody recognize that it was them? Pretty much. The impression I got is people didn't know what was going on, but they knew who it was. Okay. And they were looking, and they were looking up there, because you couldn't see anything from the street. Right. I don't know if you've been on Savo Row or not, but mm-hmm. you can't see anything up there when you look from the street up, you know. Mm-hmm. So the only people that could really see it were the people who were on the other tall buildings and windows and on ledges and stuff like that could really see. But uh, my understanding is everybody knew who it was really quick, you know. And, of course, as soon as one person knew it was, they go, well, it's the Beatles. Oh, it's the Beatles. And they just pass it around, you know. Up and down the street. Right. Was it? I I assume it was very loud for you up on the roof. I don't remember it being very loud. Really? I really don't. Because now I'm trying to think where the music was projected. I think probably like being on stage. That's interesting. I never thought about this, uh, Steve. Mm. My impression would be it'd be like standing on the stage with a band. It used to stand like. Um, okay. Camps with Waylon and stuff, and the music being projected away. Away, from me. right? Okay. And maybe that's what it, maybe that's what it was up there. That now that's interesting. I've never even thought about that. But no, I don't remember it being loud up there. That loud. Who were you, who were you standing with? Who who was standing near you during the during that? Well, Kevin Kevin uh, Har- uh, Harrington and I were standing together over uh, right. Right in line with the with the band. Mm-hmm. There's that picture on my cover, and we were like three feet away from George. I mean, it, there was a small space up there. It wasn't a very big space. And uh, as I wrote in the book, you know, I was, I was a little embarrassed that it was, it was so nonchalant about being up there, and him and I are chatting while it's going on. But uh, it was uh, it was just another day. It really wasn't a way another day. There was so much exciting and so many different things, so many crazy things happening all the time that some of the people that could have come up on the roof didn't even come up because it was just another thing, you know. Hmm. And so, uh, and then uh, I sat with, um, I can't remember if I if I sat down with Yoko and Maureen and Chris, How I can't remember quite how we assembled on the bench there together. Uh, and then I can't remember if I got up I remember I helped with a chair. I can't remember, but I was basically at two places, standing there where Kevin was, or standing just leaning against the wall, and then sitting on the uh, bench with or chairs with uh, Yoko, Marie, and Chris. That's funny. Has, has all the, uh, I don't know if you've heard all the, the bootlegs of the rooftop, but has everything on the rooftop been... I mean, is there? Uh, how long was the? How long was the concert? I guess that's the question. Is, you know that I forty. It was forty forty two minutes. So and, uh, they had pre they had pre recorded some of the stuff downstairs, not pre recording as meaning to pre record, but had recorded some of the stuff downstairs, mm-hmm. and then used used some of the live stuff. I think pretty in, uh, intact from up on the roof. There's some pretty live stuff there. Uh, I know uh, when you think about how cold it was up there and how they hadn't been really been playing together for a while and stuff like that, it's really a good, uh, just a good rough, you know, the rough tapes on that are really good to listen to. They, they did really good. I was going to ask you how cold it was because I because everybody remembers you know uh, the the coat that I guess uh, the, the fur coat that John was wearing uh, you know I mean that was a yeah. um, how cold was it that day? I think it was in the forties. I Ooh. think with the wind, uh, I think it was forty seven or something there uh, that morning. And maybe it was forty seven. It may have warmed up a little bit, but we had a we did have a breeze there, and uh, you know John was really was really bothering John. He was really cold and. And George, I've never seen it on any of the film, but uh, he had me light some cigarettes and hold them between my fingers so he would go over and put his tips of his fingers up close to the coals because they were so cold and he couldn't feel the strings. And when you take all these things into consideration that they played as good as they did up there, it's, it's pretty amazing. But I think they start having a good time. Uh, 
because you, you can tell by some of the banter and just kind of the looseness of things. I think they really maybe it was a little bit of the cavern up on that roof that day, you know, just mm-hmm. jamming away. That was Ken Mansfield. Candy, what'd you think of that? Well, again, it's very interesting to hear the perspective of somebody who was right there and involved in the uh, in this event, in this happening, happening. And so, yeah, it was interesting. Um, yeah, well, I like I thought it was interesting what he said about fancying it as a downer. Um, of course, because the Beatles had just broken up. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a very vivid memory of um, standing on a bus stop with my friend going to see that in May of 1970, going to the movies, and we were waiting for the bus. And, of course, by that, you know, it was like, here comes the bus, you know. And, and um, But, of course, in that movie, that here comes, the, you know, here comes the sun didn't exist yet. But it was, it was a very big deal when that movie came out because, oh, yeah. um, you know, we had heard, you know, like you know, Paul, the big uh, press release was in April, and then you know, and then uh, Paul's album had come out. So it was really like um, it was a very big event in the lives of Beatle fans. And um, but yes, I think it was kind of seen as a downer. But that last scene, of course, was as I said earlier. You know, it was just the grandest of all grand finales. And the thing with the cops was interesting too, like the the sense that the cops were breaking it up, which sort of fits the '60s narrative of like the man coming and like you know trying right. to cool it. But in fact, it, it, that really, I guess, wasn't really it. They kind of got into it as well. So yeah, it's very interesting. I mean. My takeaway from all of this really is that I think they passed the audition. <laughs> very, very good. Thinking about those, those, you know, the young bobbies going home to their families and saying, I, I had to, uh, I was called in for a, a disturbance on Savile Row and guess what it was. Right. Know? Turns out, to, turns out to be the Beatles. Must have been something for them. And the whole thing about the man, and you, the, like you were talking about, and the whole thing about the '60s. Yeah, that was definitely part of it. But you know, Wasn't underneath there it, one uh, recording of this where something about Loretta, you playing on the roof again, right? Wasn't right. That, that Paul, Paul says, yeah. Paul, Paul says that uh, as he's singing "Get Back" at the end. In right. fact, it's, it's over the end of the movie. It's over right. the end of the movie. So All right. So that also feeds that narrative of like, you know, the bad boys and, you know, being and the man versus the man, you know. Um Yeah, I don't know. It's funny. I I, I look at I hadn't you know, I was watching it last night and, and anticipating us, you know, having this conversation and I mean, this might sound crazy, but like so much time has passed and I look at them and as I said earlier, they look so young to me and, and like there was this flash where it's like They look like the cool boys I knew in high school, frozen in time. (laughs) Wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I mean, so familiar, you know, every, every, every uh, facial, you know, every little, you know, everything. I mean, because we were, we were so, um, you know, their images, their, their look was so burned into our brains and, and they, you know, they still look so familiar in a way that is almost hard to describe. Right, right. There's a uh, there are a couple of um, for those of you in the New York area and in the Seattle area. There's a couple of recreations of the rooftop concert that I want to mention. The first is actually on the thirty on Wednesday the thirtieth at twelve thirty at the Staten Island Mall. The Blue Meanies will be doing the uh, Beatles rooftop concert. Um, on the parking garage, it says here. So, and thanks to um, Bob Gannon for passing that along. And also on February 1st, uh, Cream Tangerine, which has done this just about every year, um, but they're going to be doing a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the uh, rooftop concert. They've done a rooftop thing every year for a number of years. And it's generally in the same place. This is at the Copacabana Pike Place in Pike Place Market on Pike Place. It says Pike Place. That's the name of the street uh, starting at noon. The admission is free. And this is, by the way, on February 1st. And it and uh, you can see the concert from the front of the Copacabana Cafe Street level. So there we go. And also, um, author David Bedford, our, our friend David Bedford, is going to be on BBC Merseyside 
uh, Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. And on BBC TV Northwest uh, tonight, tomorrow, if you can understand that. Northwest tonight. The program is called Northwest Tonight, and it'll be Wednesday night. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. Anyway, so there we go. I will be back with some news. And here are a couple of quick bits of Beatle news. Ringo Starr and his all-star band yesterday revealed additional tour dates for this year, the 30th anniversary of Ringo and the all-star band, who played their first show on July 23, 1989, at the Park Central Amphitheater in Dallas, Texas. The first leg began with one U.S. show at Harris Resort, Southern California, on March 21st, and then the band heads to Japan and launches in Fuk- Fukuoka on March 27th and wraps up April 11th in Osaka. Um, the, they come back uh, to America on August 1st, 2019, resuming at Harris in Windsor, Ontario, and concludes September 1st at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. The All-Star Band features Steve Lukather, Colin Hay, Greg Raleigh, Warren Hamm, Greg Bissonnet, and the return of uh, Hamish Stewart. The, s- the current uh, tour dates cover the following cities, and more dates, we're told, will be announced soon. But here's the current cities, like I said, Windsor, Ontario, Highland Park, Illinois, Durham, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Vienna, Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia, Philadelphia, PA, Champaign, Illinois, Prior Lake, Minnesota, Council Bluffs, Iowa, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Phoenix, Arizona, Oakland, California, Lincoln, California, Paso Robles, California, and Los Angeles. He also announced that on July 7th, he'll return to Capitol Records for his annual Peace and Love birthday event. It's a Mary Hopkin news. Mary uh, re-recorded Those Were the Days last year to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the original recording in 1968. It's uh, been released on CD and digital download, and we posted a link for Amazon.com on our That's When I uh, Want Beatles Store page on Facebook. Mary and Jessica also, Mary, Jessica is her daughter, had a chat asking, uh, talking about questions that uh, fans have posed. The first part is about the making of the song, uh, Those Were the Days, which Jessica had never heard because Mary never played it for her, which is really interesting. Anyway, a link to the uh, discussion is on the Beals News and Information Facebook page, and also it's on Mary's website. Uh, Mary was also supposed uh, said to be surprised to hear that her song from Postcard, "Those uh, There's No Business Like Show Business, was used in the TV series The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So congratulations, Mary. And a last-minute ad- addition to the rooftop concert festivities, Sirius XM's Breakfast with the Beatles, hosted by Chris Carter, will pay tribute to the concert on Wednesday with a special show with three hours of live performances by the Fabs and special guest, live Little Stephen Van Zant. The show starts at 8 a.m. Eastern and 5 a.m. Pacific Time. We have a few Billboard chart positions from the issue of February 2nd, and let's start with the Billboard 200. 161 down from 143 is The White Album. 173 down from 155 is Abbey Road. 185 down from 164 is The Beatles' One. On the Artist 100, at 65, the Beatles are at 65, down from 48 the previous week. Top album sales, number 50, down from 41 is the White Album. 76, down from 70 is Abbey Road. 97, down from 37, after being at 88 the previous week, so it's up and down, up and down, is Egypt Station by Paul McCartney. Catalog, catalog albums, 42, down from 40 is the White Album. 49 down from 48 is Abbey Road. Vinyl chart, 15 down from 11 is Abbey Road. Top rock albums, 31 down from 22 is the White Album. 35 down from 26 is Abbey Road. 38 down from 30 is the Beatles 1. And, of course, on this day in history, on January 30th, 1969, the Beatles performed the Apple Rooftop Concert, singing Don't Let Me Down, Dig a Pony, the one after 909, I've got a feeling, God save the Queen, and get back. All right, we are back after the news, and we are 
this is time. It's time to say goodbye. Candy, thank you very much for for being all through this. Was it? Uh, did you, do you have any final thoughts before we depart? Um, no, it's. I think it's really interesting how Beatle fans are so into the anniversaries of things. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have anything brilliant to say about that. It's just that I, I, I think that's really interesting. And this is a big one. I mean, this was the last time they played in public. And, uh, you know, with it, with it. And uh, anyway, so I don't really have much else to say except, you know, buy my book. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead and say that. <laughs> Go ahead and say that. And actually, you should buy her book. It's a, it puts everything into a great perspective. Do you talk about the rooftop concert in the book? I do. I do talk about it um, in the context again, it, because like again, we said earlier, like I actually had forgotten because we've seen it in so many other contexts over the years. I had forgotten that that's where we first saw it. So I discussed it in the context of the film and how they were you know, this kind of the symbolism of them being ascendant in that way. And, you know, it was like it, with its almost quasi spiritual quality to it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I did talk about that. Um, you know, the, the book goes through the entire, we're talking about anniversaries, the book goes through all the big, you know, all the milestones, all the records, all the appearances, and, you know, seen through the eyes of fans in, in and the book is it, it tells the story in the present in other words the perceptions of fans we, we only knew what we were told we didn't know all the backstories that we now know and so it really puts you on that timeline experiencing them as the fans did um during those six amazing years so um Anyway, I didn't know we were going to get into all that, but yeah, no, I, I, uh, people seem to like it. I still get emails regularly from people who are thanking me for telling the story, for documenting the experience of first generation fans. And, uh, you know, in, in, I don't know what, 30, 20 to 30 years, we may all be gone. So, you know, if anybody wants to know what it was like, you better find out now. <laughs> that's, that's true interesting is how sentimental we've become about Beatle things and you know it's not something we really cared about or the Beatles really cared about you know 10 20 years ago but all of a sudden now we care about it a lot and I think a lot of that has to do with social media I mean it, as you notice every day there are postings about various Beatle anniversaries, mm -hmm. what they what they were recording on that particular day, which is actually, you know, pretty significant. But I mean, even things that are non recording things, non musical things, we care, you know, yeah, we, this was the day that, you know, well, certainly all the life, you know, all the um, events in their lives, you know, the, the marriages, the divorces, the mm -hmm. breakups, the uh, travel that they did but certainly you know the well of course the big one is when they met in you know at the uh church in Liverpool mm -hmm. you know that's like ground zero and and then you have you know all the events the re, you know the releases and all that but yeah I mean I think that fans first generation fans are I don't know if it's because we're getting older and maybe more sentimental about it um, you know, it was a miraculous thing that we witnessed. And so it becomes like, oh, this was the day that happened. Now, of course, the last few years, we're into the 50th, we're into the half century. So, right. so you know, the rooftop and, of course, Abbey Road, we have the 50th later this year. So there is, a, there is that, whether this will, you know, soon it's going to be the 60th. Will we still be following these anniversaries? I don't know. It, it's it's a very interesting thing. Um, That's a weird point and something I hadn't even thought about is whether we'll be still. I, I think somebody will, you know, and I don't know whether they will to the extent that they are now. I think they're picking up on, you know, these 50th anniversary things a little late. I think they should have started sooner, but. Um, I mean, well, I think the Beatles should have should have honored 50th anniversaries before this, before. The, I mean, the Sgt. Pepper box really kind of started that whole the whole thing. I mean, 
for people who remember, they did put out a 30th anniversary White Album set that basically mm -hmm. that just was a repackage. It mm -hmm. didn't have anything extra, and it 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 did have it. The only thing it had was numbers, and that was it. You know, yeah. so they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything special for the for the thirtieth anniversary of the White Album, but here comes the fiftieth, and they go, they go crazy. They, they well, again, they, they're probably realizing as they go, like, like they have this brand that is of you know, like so much value and and cultural importance, and they may be kind of, you know, they might have realized in in twenty thirteen or twenty twelve, hey, we're going to start this timeline of fiftieth anniversaries. But you're right, there was no revolver. Right. There was nothing, be nothing before Revolver. I mean, they missed all the 50th anniversaries. Right. I mean, they they put out they put out box sets. They put out the the U.S. album sets, um, both the the Capitol albums and the U.S. album box with all the, you know, the little with the remastered sound and stuff. And I have a feeling that in future future generations who will certainly be listening to them and having their images around their homes as decor. I think that they may be less tuned into the timeline than we are um, because we lived it. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, it, it, I would like, it, you know, if you're a young fan and, and you'd like to comment on that. I'd love to hear We'd love to hear your, your thoughts because that, that is an interesting thought that will younger fans, you know, really care about this stuff down the road. Uh, I think somebody will be, I think, I don't think they're going to let go of that. I, I think, uh, and I talk why, that I'm talking about, or they, I'm talking about the Beatles brain mm -hmm. trust. I don't think they're, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to go away. I well, think to a, to a certain extent. Amounts of money to be made and they know that. Right. And cause you have, you have Danny, you have Julian, you have Sean, you know, you have Mary, uh, McCartney, you have Stella, you know, there's a whole second well, generation. Stella just put out a whole line with their actual images. Right. Um, which is, a, which is amazing. That's uh I was surprised by that because it's, it's, you know, she's all, you know, high fashion and pricey, you know, like, like, uh, it's it's interesting. Like, well, did, you know, she might have just done it for a lark because they can. But I'm wondering who the market is for that in in her view. I don't know. It's interesting. I was surprised to see it actually. I I thought it was cool, but I was it surprised me. I thought it was funny that that she put out those clothes. I don't know. Yeah. That's it's almost like an homage to her dad. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's who knows. You know, these people can do whatever they want, and it will be, and somebody will buy it. That's the thing, especially if she does it, you know, uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it'll definitely get bought. Anyway, um, thank you, Candy, for for being here and talking through this. And um, you can get our podcast on iTunes and Google Play and uh, Podbean and YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And please subscribe and please send us mail to uh, Beatles News Desk at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. And thanks for listening. Uh, Candy, you want to say anything before I sign off? Just um, have a wonderful week. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I, stay, I will echo. Stay positive and stay warm if you're in the vortex. Yeah. And. Listen to listen to Beatle music. There we go. Absolutely. There are For, no side effects and there are no copays. That's right. For Candy Leonard, this and this is Steve Marinucci for Beatle News Briefs saying Be seeing you. that one market fab